Hello, hi. Thanks so much for coming out this morning. It's my great pleasure to be here at this fantastic event. So I'm sure some of you will know, hopefully, if you've watched The Apprentice, who I am, um, and maybe even a bit about myself and my business partner, at least, if not the business. Um, I'm going to start by talking a bit about my own background, then move on to tell you what my vision was, um, how I went about realising that vision via The Apprentice, my business, which is Dr. Lee Cosmetic Skin Care Clinic, the reality of having that business, um, and then the future and what, what that entails for me as an entrepreneur um, and for Dr. Leah Clinic. So I'm qualified as a doctor. I grew up in Northern Ireland, as some of you can tell probably from the accent, which I haven't quite got rid of yet. I'm from Derry, which is quite a, it's the second biggest city in Northern Ireland, but it's, it's an area of some social and economic deprivation. Um, so I was from quite humble beginnings. I was very, I worked very, very hard and I was fortunate to be quite academic. And when I was 18, I became the first member in my family to go to university. I went to the University of East Anglia. I applied for Cambridge, interviewed, and they didn't take me. So um, that's still a sore point. It's been 11 years. Um, I went to the University of East Anglia, did very, very well, came top of my university, graduated with distinction, and worked as a physician, so foundation year doctor one and two in London. While I was working within the NHS, I realised that I had some other skills outside of, I love being a physician, I still work for the NHS um, two days a week as a GP, um, and that is, that's a vocation and it's something that I love very, very much, but I realised that I had some genuine entrepreneurial flair, um, and I, I went home, I can remember it really quite vividly, I went home one April, so it was early spring, I went home and my aunt, um, I won't, won't tell you her name or which one, had had some dermal filler injected. And unfortunately, it hadn't went quite as expected and she had developed, um, it looked like a post-procedural straightforward infection, but fortunately didn't clear. She had, um, it ended up in having to have a hospital admission, some IV antibiotics, um, and really quite a nasty scar, just in her marionette line um, on one side of her face. And we were, you know, outraged really and shocked that when we looked in more into um, or when I looked more into um, the treatment that she'd had, that had been performed by a non-medical practitioner in a non-clinical environment, it had been performed in a beauty salon, and actually there were no law um, laws to protect um, the general public from such risks. So that um, almost is quite a negative um, introduction into the industry, but it is what, what spiked my attention. Um, and it really aroused my interest and I began to read a lot more about the cosmetic sector. I started to spend some time um, in Harley Street on Sundays when I would be off work um, learning about aesthetic medicine. There's no official accreditation or training in aesthetics. Um, so I paid for private mentorship with a cosmetic surgeon um, and I became quite skilled um, in that area and began injecting Botox, dermal filler. Um, and I really saw, as I'm sure any of you have a, who have a business in here, I really saw a genuine opportunity to make a positive impact in a sector and to bring about an improved standard in that field so at the time that I entered the market Botox and dermal filler this is six years ago Botox and dermal filler um, was something that was sort of a backstreet thing um, and there was or it was a very 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 elitist celebrity type thing so there was really nowhere in that mid-market space you had your sort of back end cowboy practitioners injecting in their kitchens and in tannin salons and then you had your Harley Street top cosmetic surgeon um, who's charging sort of £900 for a 15-minute um, Botox procedure. And I really wanted to create something in that middle space to bring Harley Street quality to the accessibility of the high street. And that's where I saw the opportunity to, to find Dr. Leah Cosmetics Clinics and, and really offer people a safe haven to undergo cosmetic enhancement, should they so desire, in the hands of qualified medical practitioners. So then I thought, how am I going to do this? And I, was, I wrote to my local MP to express my concerns about the cosmetic sector. I tried to get involved in various patient groups. At the time, the PIP 
um, breast implant scandal was ongoing. Um, and that, that sort of did shine a bit of a light on some of the failings of the cosmetic sector in this country, but I really needed a platform. Um, so for me, when it came to the decision of entering The Apprentice, it wasn't just about obtaining the funding, although the quarter of a million did come in handy. I really wanted also, um, if I'm completely honest, I wanted the profile, I wanted the platform to say actually what we have at the minute in the UK is not safe, this industry is not safe, it's unregulated. And I really want to make an impact and a difference. Um, and there obviously is a fantastic business opportunity there as well. So I applied for The Apprentice. I had no business experience whatsoever. Um, and it was, it was almost, I'm being completely honest, it was a bit of a surprise to actually get on the show. Um, but I got on. And as soon as I got there, I really realized how useful some of the skills that I had um, from my medical background came into place. Um, I remember we arrived on the first day um, and you're kept at a hotel during the day and it gets to about 6 p.m. and you're taken to a recording studio. You have no idea where you are. It's very disorientated. They take all of your um, electronic equipment. So you have no telephone, no contact with the outside world at all throughout the entire filming, which lasts a few months. So you have, it's almost like Big Brother and you live in a house with these people. You have no contact with the outside world. Um, but you're not actually filmed in the house. You're only filmed on task. Um, but I had come off a set of nights, I was working in a and &E at the time, and I'd come off a set of nights, so I'd slept all day um, in the hotel, and when we arrived, they told us we were going to have to stay up and film all night for the first task, but I had just come off nights, so I, I was in the right routine, and everyone else became really moody at about 2 a.m., and they were snapping at each other, no one could do mental arithmetic because they were all so tired, and we weren't allowed any calculators or anything, but I had just come off the back of that sleeping pattern, so I did very, very well in the first task, and I think that set the precedence. Um, and they thought, this girl can do this without sleep, but actually I slept all day. Um, but we, um, so I did very well in the process and I was delighted to win. Um, and then that gave me my business partner. So a quarter of a million pounds and Lord Alan Sugar. And um, then I'm thinking, oh dear, <laughs> now I've actually got to make a success of this company. And it's fantastic to have a vision um, and to take steps to realize that, but actually executing that was the hardest year of my life. So The Apprentice was a walk in the park in comparison to that first year in business. And I can remember, um, I have a great fondness for Alan Sugar. He has been a fantastic, not only a fantastic business partner, but a fantastic mentor for me. And in that first six months, I'm not joking when I say this, I had that man tortured. I was calling him day and night. And it was a real baptism of fire. I can remember we, first of all, I couldn't find, challenge number one, finding premises, D1 use premises in London for a medical business is bloody impossible. So I went around every D1 use site available. I, none of them were suitable. In the end, we spent three months looking. We'd hired all sorts of agents who were charging ridiculous finders fees to try and find them. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, we were actually can't open the clinics. I can't find anywhere to open it. And um, Alan Sugar spends a lot of time in Florida and he'd flown back for a weekend. I can remember he called me and he said, I'm going to narrow it down to three and I'll pick one. I'm thinking, oh God. So the three that I found were literal bu like building sites. So they're like in construction still. It was a complete and utter mess. Anyway, we walked around all three. Um, and in the end, we got to the third one and he looked at me and I looked at him and I thought, what are we going to do? These are all awful. Um, and he said, just pick the best and we'll make it work. And I said, well, what one? And we went with the one that we ended up with, which is our clinic in Murgate. And we made it work. And the, <laughs> the unfortunate thing about it was we actually opened beside a dentist who I, you've got to bear in mind, I'm 25 at this point. I've worked as a doctor and I think that everyone who's being nice is my friend and they want to help me because typically doctors and my previous colleagues and you know companions who are all medics are all nice people and they're not trying to screw you over and this guy who owned the dentist next door I thought he was being really really nice before we opened he wanted to see all of my treatments all of my prices all of our service offerings who I was going to recruit what equipment I was going to use so I'm telling him all of this stuff obviously not thinking anything about it. And then two days before we opened, he rebranded his entire dentist into a cosmetic clinic and undercut me on every single price. And I can remember coming out into the foyer and we share a foyer, which is very um, unfortunate. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this must be some sort of joke. And I phoned Lord Sugar and I'm hysterical at this point, like hysterical, and I'm crying on the phone. This is terrible, what am I gonna do? Oh my goodness. And I can remember him just saying, Leah, you need to get tough. 
Don't ever call me about this again. You need to get tough, pull yourself together and just get on with it and make it work. And, you know, that was really, really right. And I think that from that point on, I developed a much, much thicker skin. And I think we've been, um, we've been shafted more times than that. But I think after that, I learned not to take things so personally. And I think that for me, anyway, um, was my toughest lesson in business that, you know, people are out sometimes for their own gain and their own commercial gain and they'll put that above um, maybe other things that I that I didn't think would actually happen. So challenge number one premises, Ta challenge number two, um, it's like being thrown into a den of lions, business in London, um, so overcoming that. And then we actually had to get people through the door. So that, I think that's the challenge for most service businesses. You can have, by this point we've refurbished the clinic um, I feel like I've got some level of qualification I'm building. We've done two complete refurbishments. Um, and we then needed to get people through the door. So advertising, marketing, again, I had very little experience there. Um, and with £250,000, although it sounds like quite a lot, it actually is. By the time you pay a rent deposit, that had taken up a large, large chunk of that money. Um, we had then paid finder's fees. We had legal fees on the lease agreement. We had to buy capital investment for the equipment. So a cosmetic laser is 50 to 60,000 um, pounds. So actually there isn't a huge um, amount of spending in 250,000 if you have a, a bricks and mortar business. Um, so by the time January, we launched the 22nd of January, three years ago, so my business is three, um, and it was my birthday. We launched on my 26th birthday. Um, and when we actually launched the business, we were probably down to, in the bank account, probably not too far shy of about £10,000. So we really needed to get people through the door. And we got a few, but they did not come in their heads. And that first year for me was spent quite literally going door to door around offices in Murrogate, doing every talk, every single thing that I could do to increase the profile of my business. And I think what astonished um, what astonishes me, and I'm, I'm so humbled to be here speaking to you today, is that I had a massive, massive launch pad for that business. I had a 10 million viewing audience for that series of The Apprentice. I had one of the most profiled business names that our country's ever generated as a business partner. I myself had had national um, press, and we had a national press launch, and it was still tough to get people through the door. We were in a central London, buzzing um, environment, and we were not in an economic, a period of economic downturn, and it was still by far the hardest thing I've ever done was the first 12 months of that company to get it really up to where it is today. So I really take my hat off to all of you amongst us who do that organically without that sort of launch pad. It really, really is tough and I have the utmost respect for, for self-starters. Um, so the reality of running the business, um, you know, amongst the challenges, and there definitely were challenges, there were huge amounts of triumphs as well. And it's the little things that I really remember. So I can remember um, we couldn't afford a specific type of laser initially. And when we got, it took me six months, seven, seven months, um, to have generated enough revenue that we could afford this laser. And I really, really wanted it because it did thread vein removal. And that probably means nothing to most of you. But for me, that was like a really big thing because I think that facial redness is a big problem for people. Um, and I wanted it so much. And I I remember thinking about it every day for about seven months, I just need that laser, I need that laser, I need that laser. We got to seven months, so it was late summer, and we had a board meeting and the, the, our financial controller finally signed off that we could get the Alma laser for thread vein removal. And I can remember feeling really overwhelmed, like almost in tears. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, that's how you feel about a laser. You just get real. Um, but yeah, it, it's the little things like that. When we got that laser, I was so proud. Um, and my staff loved it because it was a really advanced piece of technology and we're all very excited about cosmetic treatments because it's our thing. Um, and we were all practicing, none of us have any facial thread veins anyway, but if we did, they would be blitzed by now. And it was just, um, it was just a fantastic moment. And for me, the other thing that I really remember is I came under a huge amount of criticism by the industry. I think, um, you know, the cosmetic sector is a very competitive one. It's very lucrative. Um, and there was a lot of hostility towards myself as a young person coming into that field um, and from the, plat from the apprentice platform as opposed to um, other platforms people enter that sector from. And this year we won um, our first national prize which was for the best cosmetic clinic in London and that was voted for by the general public, um, by a mystery shopper and also by a panel um, of experts from my industry. So 
to have won that within two and a half years coming from um, the level of hostility and negativity there was towards us in the industry. I remember doing a panel in the first um, few months of the business and they literally booed me off the cosmetic panel. It was very uncomfortable. Um, so to within two and a half years have transformed that into what is um, the, the leader essentially in London for cosmetic um, practice has been an enormous achievement and it's probably my biggest achievement to date. So, the future, we have our flagship clinic in London. Um, I now have 18 staff in total. We've opened a second location in Essex and we're scaling at one clinic per year at the minute. Um, so, we, we, we are scaling at that rate because we don't, don't want to um, have external funding and for quality assurance reasons. So, for us, the main, the main thing is that we continue at the standard of care um, that we provide at the minute. So there are locations to open in London this year along with the skincare line, Dr. Leah Skincare, available online, all good retailers. And that will be available in summer. So it's a really, really exciting time for us. And it's been an amazing journey for me. And I would love if any of you had any questions that I could help you with to ask them. Thanks. I find um, recruitment is one of the toughest challenges. So how do you go about ensuring that you get quality staff to keep up your standards? We pay recruiters a lot of money. <laughs> um, we do use recruitment companies. I think just in, we didn't at the start because we couldn't afford them. Um, but as time has went on, you know, I think that you realize that people are expert in recruitment because it is a speciality in its own right. Um, and why I would begrudge in the first year paying um, whatever percentage it is if their annual income. I think now actually seeing the quality that they can produce um, of candidate then we use recruiters for all our key positions and we have done now for about the past year so initially we did it ourselves and now we use recruitment companies but we do a lot of in-house training as well and I think I think that's really the key and all brands will will want to put their own stamp even with the best of employees you want to to make sure that that your own brand values are really really paramount um in in how they're conducting themselves in your company so use recruiters and have good in-house training that's my advice just on the first year's funding you, you were down to ten thousand. did you actually make the books balance by the end of the year we did the first, we filed our accounts at the end of June and we were minus 49,000, which meant that we had spent 210,000 from 240. So we made 30,000 pounds profit in the first four months um, and we're very profitable at the minute. <laughs> you were talking about your guerrilla marketing techniques because you didn't have a big marketing yeah. budget. What did you find was the most effective um, in terms of least cost and most feet through the door? I think that you need to take responsibility um, as a business owner, especially if it's a service-based business. They, people want to see you, they trust you, at least before you can create a brand, you need to get buy-in as an individual. Um, so for me, what worked best was literally myself going into office spaces, asking if we can do demonstrations at lunch times. Um, we did, I mean, I was doing leaflets at 7am at, at the tube station, at Keynes Cross tube station, at, at Liverpool Street, everything. I mean, there's, there's nothing that you won't do in that first year because you know what your bank balance is sitting at and you know you've got to get people through the door and you can have the best. By this point, we've got a fully kitted out state-of-the-art clinic in London. I have the best injectors, the best therapists, the best accountants that I could ever have had, the best training, and everything's ready to go, but we have no people. And I think you as the business owner, that's your responsibility. And even if I had I had a massive marketing budget, I think that the key to getting that, that customer loyalty to start, you know, is to, to acquire the customers in the right way. So I did a lot of events. I literally was standing outside eight. There's an eight opposite my clinic in Margate um, at lunch times, giving out free sun creams. I mean, it was bleak midwinter um, just to try and <laughs> get people to talk to me and say, listen, we're a cosmetic clinic, come in. Um, and you've really got to be willing to do that. And it's not the most glamorous part of the job. Um, but I really believed in the services that we were offering. And I knew that we had a fantastic um, product, a fantastic service to offer. And I wanted people to experience that. 
and with cosmetic treatments in particular, Botox, dermal filler, facials, laser, a lot of it is about word of mouth and I knew that the quality was there and the service was going to be fantastic. I just needed to get those first people through the door and then they would talk um, to their friends, colleagues, etc. Um, and that still remains. We did the same with Essex and we'll do the same with our second London branch this year. Um, that still remains our, our strategy when we open. You need to be you need to be on the ground and you need to be pulling people in yourself and I'm still very, very happy to do that. Good morning. Hi. After the, the first year when you didn't get the, the result you expected, what was your best decision you, to make it work? Mm. I cut my own, so I don't talk about this publicly really, but I um, took a massive salary dip myself. Um, it cost a lot more to set up the clinic than we thought, to be honest, it was going to cost and I was taking a salary from when we incorporated the company and I stopped taking it um, until we opened and until we went into profit. And that was obviously very hard for me on a personal level. So I was locuming still um, in A&E um, while we were setting up the company um, or while we were doing that first year. So yeah, I think that you have to be willing to make personal sacrifice for the greater um, good of your company and you have to you know you have to put that first there's huge temptation just on the market and thing as well the metro kept coming to us um, to advertise it was 13 I still remember the figures it was 13,000 for a half spread half page spread um, and they were promising all sorts and I thought you know there's a real temptation <laughs> to just do that because it sounds like a quick fix but I mean, we had 10,000 around the 13th, so I couldn't. But if I had have had the 13,000, I probably would have done it. And it, it definitely, we've, we've since done paid advertising. It hasn't given a return on investment for us um, in that way. But I can remember, you know, when you're in that period and you're just desperate to get people through the door and to really, really make it work, um, you can be really lured by, by some of these advertising marketing opportunities. And really, what is best to do is think what genuinely um, do I know what is going to cost me the least and is definitely going to be able to get some people through the door and that's going out and doing it yourself. Um, so I'm really glad that I didn't spend a lot on paid advertising in that first six months and that I, um, that I was willing to make a personal sacrifice myself in terms of what I was taking with the company in order to get up off the ground. Please join me in thanking Dr. Leah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.